How are we feeling about animal ID traceability today compared to five years ago? If we would categorize it on a scale of one to ten, ten being encouraged about how we're at or where we're at today versus one discouraged. How many of you are above five? Excellent. Excellent. Anybody below a five? We've got a few. So that in itself, I think, is a, a, good, a good indicator. Um, I have to tell myself this on occasion that um, things are coming together. I think it's always easy to want more. And I think with traceability is a good example. Uh, on occasion, we have a lot of discussions where Maybe there's more comments about frustration than accomplishments. On February, in February 2010, USDA announced a new approach to animal disease traceability. In January 2013, we published a final rule on traceability. It maybe wasn't as extensive as what some of us might have preferred or comprehensive, but I like to kind of look at it as it put a stake in the ground, and that was the intent, was to come back to a basic fundamental system that we could continue to build from and make progress from. <clears throat> the good thing is, today, March 2015, we're still building from those initial principles when we announced the implementation of ADT. So given the spectrum of the last 10, 12 years on animal ID issues, it's kind of a historic type or time because we are continuing to move forward from those original principles on ADT. We can't say that in maybe previous iterations of animal ID. So I too feel good about where we're at today that we can continue to make progress. As we know, CFR Part 86 was the traceability regulation for livestock moving interstate. <coughs> Pretty basic official ID for livestock that are covered by the rule. ICBI movement documentation. Again, using a, a document that's not really a movement document in itself, ICBI, but it's highly correlated to reflect where animals moved from when they moved interstate. So instead of burdening the stakeholders with new processes, trying to capitalize on a document, a health certificate, if you will, that's been around for many years. We always need to acknowledge that ADP, what we're implementing, is not full traceability. You know, our trading competitors, they're they're more advanced, and I think as we look down the road, we'll have to continue to, to look at this opportunity in the, in the future, but today we are not implementing full traceability. If we continue to maintain traceability without the regulation, we would have continued to lose official ID. With the official ID, we'll, we are able to supplement uh, what we would have otherwise. Without official ID, we still had good traceability from the slaughter plant going back with a back tag, get us to that previous production point or market, and the market would have records, of course, who the consigner of that animal was. So uh, that's been pretty, pretty successful. With the regulation and other efforts taking forward, we really look at ADT as being a bookend plus system trying to locate where the animal was officially identified and then have the opportunity through the utilization of ICBIs determine other points along the way, premises when that animal moved interstate. So I refer to it as a bookend plus system because it's, it's more than just a basic bookend system. When we in, in implemented ADT, we 
work from the principle that it's a performance-based program. We're not going to count necessarily how many premises are registered to measure success, but really to come up with some performance measures that reflect our ability to retrieve information that is typically used in traceback investigations. So if we look at the same illustration, if you will, we have four basic performance measures. One is really so basic, we don't measure it uh, to a big extent, at least not with the metal clip tags, because the number one trace measure is in what state administered the number. The noose tags that are still uh, the most highly used, the code structure, the animal number tells you what state administered the tag. It'll be more applicable as we continue to uh, utilize more 840 tags, what, what state administered the number if it came through the state. But the second traceability activity uh, is the time it takes a state to determine the location where an animal was officially identified. So it's that um, first bookend as we look at it. It might not necessarily be the birth premises, but hopefully at a young age. So for the last several years, we've been working on establishing national baseline values to measure progress. 255 exercises were uh, used in determining the national baseline value to determine how quick we could determine where an animal was officially identified. <clears throat> we were able to find that information 177 times. Now in these trace exercises, once uh, states or individuals working on the exercise, you know, this is a test. I can't devote 100% of my resources to determining that information. So after a given period of time, they would have just said, I've got to discontinue that exercise. And so that was a trace that was not um, counted as successfully retrieved the information. So. 69% uh, of the time information was successfully found and it took 88 hours. So from this point forward we want to continue to measure this. And this was, this was going back in time. There was controversy, maybe concern that we were going too far back in time because we're looking at older records. But we wanted to reflect our ability to retrieve those records prior to the implementation of ADT. Number three, again, it pertains to the use of ICBIs for interstate movement, primarily ICBIs. The time it takes to determine the state an animal was shipped from when it moved interstate into your state. So if I'm in Kansas, I've got an animal that came, I know came in to Kansas. How long does it take me to determine from what state the animal came from? 439 exercises, 250 five times information was found, or 58% of the time, 139 hours to retrieve that information. And number four, if I'm the state where the animal was shipped from, finding the information to determine what actual premises the animal left from within my state. 393 exercises, 300 times information was found for 77%, took 264 hours. So these are the baseline values that we will use to measure and document progress, and it's all about uh, how timely we can retrieve information to find these answers. You know, some of them are pretty basic. They're all very basic. But if, if, if we're tagging animals officially and we cannot determine where that animal was located, we're not getting much return our, on our investment for official animal ID. So. A lot of efforts are, are focused on, on these traceability performance measures. As I indicated earlier, we used records for the baseline values, events, tagging events, movement events from 2009, 2010, and 2011. So the next step in regards to performance measures is continue to collect trace exercises. <coughs> and for the states, we're using the 2014 trace recording template. We're extending our collection period for 
exercises that we're doing now through June 2015. Last year we found it necessary to have supplemental exercises because we ran too short on the number of exercises that were submitted. This year we want to make sure we don't have to go out and do extra exercises. We want to um, get those administered systematically through uh, the next few months. We're encouraging everybody, our, own, our folks that work with the states, to follow the 2014 guideline on traceability exercises or traceability performance measures. Key to the administration of the exercises is that what you're measuring must align with the activity as it's defined. If we're trying to determine where an animal was tagged in your state and you're trying to do something in a different state, uh, we're not looking at the right type of activity. So number one, make sure we're measuring what's defined by the activity. And this year, based on cattle populations, we've actually assigned, if you will, a quota for each state to achieve the higher states, Texas, you're blessed with having the privilege of doing more traces than, than others. Um, but bottom line is we want to make sure we have an adequate number of records to have reliable uh, data. So it will be our objective then in August, September to calculate our first comparison to those national baselines. <laughs> We're currently using a very basic approach that's somewhat of a pain, uh, an Excel trace recording template, and we'll, then we have to mail the spreadsheets around. What we're looking at doing for the next um, period for measuring these trace exercises, we'll be using Emergency Management Response System version 2. The, the folks have developed a utility within EMRS to more systematically take advantage of real trace information that you utilize that we want to align with those activities. But then it also um, provides, if you will, a centralized system for putting that information in, eliminates the need to, uh, to mail spreadsheets around. Uh, it will be a significant undertaking because not all the states use EMRS. We are working with some states on testing the utility in April, uh, extensive training May and June, and then converting over to the uh, new collection tool for the administration of trace exercises in July, which will start the third period. Uh, it will be the second period that we compare to the national baselines. So the states that are here uh, look forward, if you will, for training on utilization of EMRS-2 for the administration of trace test exercises. Certainly, as we continue to implement ADT, the monarch and compliance um, task, if you will, has been implemented. That phase in was established March 2014 and really focus on, if you will, repeat offenders. We spent a good year on training, education, education, training, and, you know, after an individual finds it impossible to follow the regulation the third and fourth time, uh, how much more time do we spend on uh, communication or education? And we're talking about a fraction of a percent of the folks. But these repeat offenders that can't get it right is really what we're targeting in, rega in regards to monitoring and compliance. We established an ADT monitoring and compliance document with the uh, objective of having a uniform approach to monitoring and compliance across the entire uh, country. It's a key resource for VS resources. We certainly encourage cooperation of the states when it's applicable, especially if their regulations align with the federal. But it was certainly our intent to uh, keep with the transparency approach in the publication of, of the monitoring and compliance document. Priority focus for monitoring and compliance, of course, is official ID or the animals that move interstate that require 
I, official ID? Are they in fact officially identified? Are we properly recording the information so we can find the information when we need it? Credited veterinarians, records of tags applied, our own folks in the system, AIN manufacturers, AIN distributors, are they putting the information into the animal identification management system so that information can be retrieved? So again, very important on, on the processes and the information part of it. ICVIs, again, animals that require an ICVI, are, are they fulfilled? But also on accredited veterinarians, are they properly completed? We want to do a real good job making sure the information is properly recorded, especially the ship from and ship to address when possible. We know there's challenges on the destination information at times, but when it's clear of uh, having that completely um, recorded. I see uh, the uh, official identification numbers on certificates uh, is a challenge, but something that we've got to continue to do extremely well. Collection of ID at slaughter, so if we're asking producers to get tags put in ears, we want to make sure the ID is cross-referenced through the carcass, through inspection, so if there's a specimen taken, that animal ID can be correlated to the, the, the blood or the specimen that's uh, collected at slaughter. <coughs> Based on March of 2014 through December 2014, we have a little tally sheet that we uh, have folks fill out on a quarterly basis to kind of give us a, a sense for uh, enforcement actions that are being conducted. Letters of information is basically after an individual has been advised of the regulation and they don't conform with it, it's a first formal process, a little more documentation on um, the issues, and then if we still find problems with compliance, uh, VS turns the case over, if you will, to enforce, uh, investigative enforcement services, IES, and they take it forward to initiate an investigation. So during that period of time, uh, over a thousand letters of information and 33 cases uh, initiated with IES. We don't have a record because we're not part of IES per se of how many of those have, uh, those have actually been uh, brought forward. Robert mentioned some changes on official ID that took place in, in March. Um, I think we're doing pretty good on the official ear tag shield. Uh, 840 tags have always had the uh, official ear tag shield on the tags. The majority of the uh, metal tags, the metal clip tags, called NOOSE, National Uniform Ear Tagging System tags, come through the warehouse, and we made sure that all of those tags have the U.S. shield on them. So the states that are obtaining tags directly from a different supplier, it's their responsibility to make sure the tags that they're obtaining direct from a manufacturer have the U.S. shield on them. For a manufacturer to be authorized to imprint the shield on a tag, that tag first has to be approved by USDA. But I think overall a high percentage of the tags out there have the U.S. shield on them. Also on official ear tags, hopefully we're all on board with acknowledgement that the phase out of the USA prefix and the manufacturer coded tags went into effect on March 11 of this year where tags applied after that date basically are not any longer considered official. We can debate how we're going to know when an animal was tagged, but it, it's the idea of establishing a transition to move away from those numbering systems as far as acknowledging them as official ID numbers. The intent was, was to allow enough time in the marketplace to work out of inventories that already existed at the producer level or in the systems so that uh, they could be used up and uh, we still have the new numbering system and the prime ID plus management number but for, eight, for the AIN tags it's basically the 840 
from this point forward. And that's, that's basically because we have more control, if you will, of the 840 numbering systems. We, USDA, allocates those to approved manufacturers. They, in turn, report the distribution records uh, to the animal identification management system, where on some of these other numbering systems, we, USDA, really doesn't have the authority to ask for um, distribution records of those tags. Um, so that's why we're wanting to move, we're elected to move to the 840 as the uh, sole numbering system for the 15 digit number. Location identifiers, um, just looking at some um, statistics a few days ago, over 700,000 PINs, premise ID numbers, have been issued since we started. And actually, the premises ID allocator was started before NAIS. So once NAIS started, the tabulation of pins issued was over 600,000. That goes back to, should be August 2004, not 14. When we implemented ADT, we agreed to acknowledge other um, numbering systems for premises IDs. We call them LEDs, location identification uh, numbers. We have an established format, so there's uniformity, six or eight. The first two characters are the state postal abbreviation. Based on the records we have, 17 states have reported the format to the premises repository. That's important for us, and I'll get to the reason why in just a little bit. But we have a record of 173,000 lids that have been reported to the repository, premises repository. Those records only have the code structure. Of course, we know what state they came from because they're prefixed by the state postal code. So the reminder is that if you're using lids in your state, you need to report the lid to the repository because when a tag manufacturer ships an 840 tag, they need to confirm that there's a location identifier on record because they're responsible for reporting the distribution record to the animal identification management system and the management, the animal identification management system aligns those AIN numbers with a premises ID or lid. Uh, it's gotten better, but we still run into cases where a producer or somebody says to us, what's the deal? I can't buy 840 tags. And just about every time it's because the lid wasn't reported to the repository. So the manufacturers are doing their job by saying, sorry, we can't provide an 840 number to you because you don't have a, a, a valid lid or pin. And valid means that the number is on the repository. And we do that to make sure that first bookend, where we have the tag aligned to a premises, that we can do a bang up job getting that piece of information connected to where those tags are distributed. So a reminder to the states that are using LIDs, and Keith, this goes back, what, three, four years ago when you were starting to, at least three years ago, where you were making these comments, that uh, we really need to get the LIDs put to the system. Our animal disease traceability help desk is available to help the states that haven't uh, done that yet. Uh, for SCS states, you guys that are using the uh, information system that VS provides to the states for animal health, that system is automatically integrated to the repository anytime the state issues a, a lid behind the scenes that lid code is sent to the repository for USA herds it's my understanding that that's still a, a standalone process where you can uh, move a, a bunch of them in a ASCII file to the uh, repository but USA herds itself is not uh, interfaced if you will with the repository for this process thought it was interesting to take a look at the use of the noose tags. We call noose the National Uniform Ear Tagging System. 
but it's basic brucellosis and what we refer to as the bright tag, the silver tag with, with that numbering system. 2009, right at 4 million. Uh, 2014, uh, probably uh, a little over 6 million. And then a projection for 2015, a little bit of a spike up to 10 million. Not as significant as I would have projected. <coughs> I think the decrease in 2014 was due to inventories were built up in 2013. I'm not sure why the first few year, uh, months of this year we've got a, a little bit of a spike. It might be more states are inventorying tags for vaccination. I'm not sure. But of interest is the uh, continued increase in the AIN tags in 2000. And uh, 14, we all almost reached 5 million tags, and based on the first few months of this year, up to over 6 million. So, significant increase in the AIM tags. I wanted to spend just a little bit of time talking about acknowledging implementation challenges. I'm not sure we have an answer for all the challenges, but hopefully through ongoing discussions, they can be documented. Not to any surprise, the manual recording of the numbers on the silver clip tags or the brucellosis tags is, is a challenge. We hear it a lot. Still don't hear it as much as I expected we'd hear it. We, we no longer accept accredited veterinarians putting on a second, third, fourth noose tag, so reading that number is, is required to fill out an ICBI when the regulation calls for the recording of the IDs for certain classes of animals. And I'm talking pretty much in the, in the cattle sector. A couple years ago, there was a lot of discussions about the variability of state regulations, accredited veterinarians finding a challenge to know how to prepare health certificates for movement of animals from one state to another. 2013 USAHA Resolution 26 uh, made a recommendation that between uh, USHA, NIAA, USDA, and other stakeholders that uh, we find a solution uh, to help solve this issue. Ben's going to make comments here in a little bit on where we're at in that regard. So we had a, a challenge, but it's getting addressed at least in a, in a, in a formal manner to help uh, clarify some of the confusion that exists today on variability of state regulations. In my uh, time on ADT, probably the last couple years, the most frequently discussed topic is the interstate movement of, quote, for slaughter animals. We have an exemption of an ICBI and official ID for those animals that move to an approved livestock facility. Whether it's the value of cattle in the recent past or whatever, there's more, seems to be more concern about some of these animals that don't move on to slaughter. They were represented as um, for slaughter. No ID, official ID was necessary. They got moved on an ownership or statement instead of a ICBI and concern is that more and more of these animals don't actually uh, move on to slaughter, they get diverted. Not sure we have a silver bullet or an answer. We've got to continue to keep our eyes and ears open in our monitoring enforcement practices. Um, but uh, probably an issue that we'll continue to wrestle with. Another issue that has been brought up in, in, in some cases, more so in the dairy side, is the 840 AIN tag is restricted to U.S. born animals only. This is not new. We saw this coming down the pike before we pr had a proposed rule. And I know there's been discussions. Prior to March 15th, it wasn't that big of an issue because the 900 series tag was recognized as an official ear tag. So if I'm a dairy producer and I bring in some Canadian cattle and they have a Canadian 240? 124. 124. Country code 124 
for whatever reason, that TALIC malfunctions, is lost, and I have the RFID button tag integrated into my parlor system for daily milk weights, and I'm already tagging my calves, yearlings, if you will, whatever, with 840 tags. What's my option for putting an official RFID tag on that Canadian import? There isn't one by the regulation. Can't put on an 840 tag. The 900 series tag is no longer official. So the only thing we can recommend is if that animal ends up moving interstate, a metal clip tag or the noose tag will be the official method of ID. And if you want to use electronic ID in the parlor, the low frequency tags, you still have to put in a 900 tag. Not a practical solution. Far from being ideal. I'm not sure there is an ideal solution. USDA's position is that we recommended changing this regulation prior to the write-up of the proposed rule, and the industry did not support changing that. So if there's <coughs> a desire to reconsider the current regulation that restricts the use of 840 to U.S.-born animals only, it's really got to be brought forward by a strong group of support from the industry sector. That's what we would encourage folks to do. We're receptive to that, but I don't think USDA is going to um, take the lead on that. We're really receptive to what folks would recommend as a long-term solution. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Another, as mentioned earlier, we also restrict the use of multiple official ear tags. So again, accredited veterinarians can't throw on the second, third, fourth noose tags when they're preparing cattle for interstate movement. That was a highly practiced, or commonly practiced anyway, uh, practice because it's easier to put on a new tag if, and record the first number if I'm loading out 80 head, record the last number and draw a line through the, the lines on the health certificate. Based on the regulation today, if those cattle already have a metal clip tag, that number needs to be read and recorded on the ICBI and not a, a second metal clip tag or a noose tag, silver tag, put in the ear. There were exceptions to this restriction. Number one, if I put in a silver tag and a young calf at uh, two weeks of age or whatever, that animal is vaccinated at six months of age. It's fine to put in the, the brucellosis <coughs> tag. So you have a silver tag and a brucellosis tag in that calf. We agreed that adding an 840 visual tag to an animal already tagged with a noose tag is acceptable, along with adding an 840 RFID to a visual 840 tag. So we have allowances when we were looking at enhancing the technology of ID for that animal, we said adding a, a, an additional tag was okay because we want to make it more efficient to record that animal ID. And then just recently, um, we had UHF tags in some of the, in one of the pilot projects anyway, um, that were put on animals that had already been tagged with a low frequency. 840 tag. So we've already had some limited cases where the same animal has had two different 840 tags on it, different technologies. So we've got some challenges. I think everybody is very supportive of enhancing the technology for the ID of the animals. Part of the challenge is on uh, the Bruce uh, uh, test charts, I, I think for both TB and brucellosis, for example, um, it requires that all official ID be recorded. And so we've, we've got challenges recording some of these IDs on animals that have still multiple ID numbers. The regulation for ICBIs says the official, the official ID number must be recorded on ICBIs. I don't know what the refers to, but it doesn't say all. So we'll have to have some discussions on clarifying this. Um, 
because I think we'd have a, a significant battle on our hands if we're going to put in higher technology tags and still require that the visual only tags be read. We wouldn't gain anything in, if we're going there. So um, because it doesn't say all, my interpretation would be one of the officials and if one of them can be read electronically, that should suffice, but we want to get out clear policy interpretation on that. Hey, Neil, could you repeat that? I think I know what you said. So if, if there's a bright tag and they apply a ultra high frequency tag, the bright tag has to be reported? Yeah, so yeah, I'm glad you asked that because I'm, yeah, there's two different scenarios. So one event is when I'm adding the RFID tag to an animal that's already got a visual only tag. The person applying the 840 RFID tag to an animal that's tagged with the bright tag is to record the bright tag at that time and maintain that link between that noose number and the 840 number. It's a good discussion. <laughs> Two, uh, six months later, a year later, that same animal moves interstate commerce. So this accredited veterinarian is presented with an animal that's already got two tags. My comment was that because the rule says the official ID number for that animal must be recorded, I don't think we can, we have to accept one of those official numbers. And if they're using electronic ID, that should suffice. But the regulation still requires the initial marriage of those two numbers up front when that tag is applied. If we don't do that, we'll have to have some discussions on compliance or, you know, have other discussions. Specific, please. But on the official, on the official test chart, you said all ID has to be Yes, recorded. that's, CDI that's, just one. yeah. Okay. And that's based on the program regulations, not part of traceability regulations. Other implementation challenges, uh, we're going to talk later today with the National Assembly about um, the recording of all numbers on dairy bull calves. You know, these calves that are a couple days old, several weeks old, that move for feeding slaughter purposes. It was the intent to identify all dairy animals, officially ID all dairy animals, and require the recording of the official ID number on movement documents for the breeding animals. Well, we've got some animals that are moving through the system that are sexually intact, but their purpose of movement is not for breeding. But if we go by the regulation, we still have those calves that are intact today that are to be recorded. They get castrated a week later, the next movement, they don't have to be recorded. So I think we've got an issue to address, but we want to make sure we're consistent and uniform in our desire as far as what uh, is the appropriate way to address what I think was an oversight in the way the regulation was written. Going back to this slide, and I'll be closing in a little bit, but um, or turning it over to Jack. Another point about this when I look at it is opportunities. 95% of AIN 840 tags are RFID based. So while we have a lot of visual options for 840 tags, a high, high percentage of those are RFID tags. So the growth in those tags is growth in electronic ID, which I think is encouraging. And a high majority of these tags would be purchased by producers. We have the UHF demonstration projects. That others are going to talk about. Um, and that's pretty dark, Robert. By the lights or yeah. Somebody, by the light switch. But another area that I think is 
some opportunities for <coughs> addressing some of the issues of concern that we've already seen, and it's still pretty dark, but uh, Angus cattle are moving through uh, the alleyway where readers are attached to those posts. Welcome. How, what percentage of the tags were read? Do you know? 100%. 100%. Uh, and again, I apologize for it not being brighter. It's on the screen, real easy to, to see. Um, some folks are going to talk about the pilot projects that we have for UHF tags, ultra-high frequency technology tags that might uh, be able to address some of the issues of concern about the problems of recording numbers off of metal tags when we're preparing cattle for interstate movement. So as we continue to look down the road, I think there's uh, solutions that we can consider in the future. I'm going to turn it over to Jack now, and he's going to talk more about some of the key USDA implementation priorities and other points that Jack would like to make. Thanks, Neil. Before I start, I'd like to say that as part of our reorg, some ch many changes have been made, and, and what happened in that reorg was we are now a, a force of one in, in ADT, and that's Neil. And he's done a tremendous job up to this point. We've had a retirement with John Wimmers. Uh, other folks have left the program or moved on, but I just wanted to give notice to Neil and the great job he's done for us. Thank you, Neil. Um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about what, what's going on in USDA with regard to uh, ADT, and I wanted to start by saying that um, it's one of our administrator's top ten goals, which means monthly we report to him the progress that we're, that we're making in regards to ADT. And there's been some numbers thrown around, and I'm going to share those with you. Um, $186 million has been spent on animal disease traceability in some form or another, whether it was NACE or something else, since 2004. Congress likes that, likes numbers, they like details, they like reporting. And so, um, as part of that, when Neil talks about the trace testing, the ICVI numbers, and the reviews of uh, location where animals were shipped from, and the hours we're reporting, what, we, what we've been telling Congress and what, what we based ADT on was 24-hour traceability. We're nowhere near that, and um, our numbers are abysmal, and it's, it's drawing focus. So much so that our own, our own uh, organization has started a review of ADT, and uh, we'll be go going through that the next couple months, and that, that review will go to our administrator. So. I just wanted to make you aware of that because that'll it, it sort of precludes some of my my comments and some of the things we're doing and why we're doing them. When uh, when we when we started out with NACE and 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 then went to the the new format where we said the states will have control of the flex and flexibility to implement their own programs. I remember the state vet of Florida, uh, who's now retired, Tom Holt came to me and said. Feel like you just drove by my house and threw a dead cat on my porch. And and that being said, you know it was it was there's a, there's been some misunderstanding I think throughout the program by our people too on what their responsibilities were and what they are. So we've we're making a lot of effort to contr to uh, change those and to straighten that to straighten that up amongst our folks and to build this program the way. Uh, we want it to be, and so what we've been doing is meeting with our, our direct district directors and talking with them on a, on a um, biweekly basis about the program and about our expectations of what we think they should be doing in cooperation with the states. So what we're, push, what we're pushing them to do is, and, and the reason we're, we're having that meeting with the district directors is as you know, we have six, di six districts now. Those district directors implement what goes on in those districts. So the uh, ADs, or the assistant directors, work under them, and they're responsible for 
all of our programs. We have specialists in each state that are ADT specialists. Those folks are our guidance, and we try to keep through those meetings that consistency. What, what they're being charged with is to go out and re reinforce that the trace activities are being completed through the cooperative agreements. The ADODRs that look at those cooperative agreements are supposed to be sitting down with the states, working on a program, <coughs> making sure that those traces are, are being implemented, making sure that the work plan and the financial plan gets us to where we need to be. And I think our ultimate goal is just to do better than we've done before. I know there's been some confusion, some misunderstandings, but we have to do better. And that's, that's, that's our charge to our folks. The roadmaps that the states completed were all supposed to be done. The, the, the monitoring and compliance document that I read, we're going to post those by April of 2014, that we wanted those all done. There's been some, some states got right on it, got it done. Some states are, are, were very slow to do it. Some states, the, the, their activities, their, their, um, their uh, documents, are, are, their roadmaps are old. They need to review them. They need to update them. And we need to move forward from there. So the other, the other charge we've, we've said to our folks is we want you back in the slaughter plants. We want you back at the markets. We want you in the buying stations. We want you working with the state to make sure that whatever it is, the, the program that they're trying to implement, that we're hand in hand with them and that we help provide that consistency that they need so that that's, that's moving forward. We're, um, we recently had, had a trade mission to China. And what we're finding out, and rather emphatically from our trading partners, is they don't think we have a traceability system. And the reason they're saying that is because a lot of countries have a system where they can tell you where the animal was born, where that tag was applied, and follow it all the way through its, its end point. So what we're seeing in, 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 as a result of that is our trading partners and, so, and our competitors are, are pointing to the U.S. and saying, well, you know, we can do this. The U.S. can't. <coughs> so we're going to be limited in markets that we're going to be able to get into. So what we're hearing from some of the different producers is, we would like to do a pilot project so that we can put tags on those animals at the beginning and trace them through to slaughter and so that we can open up that market for our group of cattle producers. Those are the kinds of things that are, that are moving forward. So those are the challenges that we're starting to see in trade. So I just wanted to make you, make you aware of, of that. Our folks, if you're having a problem with FSIS, and they're not collecting all man-made slaughter, our folks should be intervening and working to get that done. If it's a problem where we need to go all the way up to Washington, D.C., I need to get that call. And I need, to, I need to cross the hall and tell them where the problem is and what needs to be done to fix it. I talked about the road maps. We're supposed to be using those road maps as our long-term plan of where we're going to, how the state's going to get to where they want to go. And that's supposed to outline the slaughter, tracing, everything that you want to do in your roadmap. <coughs> so that's why we're asking you to update them. And uh, as I said, we still, have, we still have one state that's never, never submitted one. And uh, I believe the roadmaps, when did we start asking for roadmaps, Neil? 12. 2012. So our goal is to get you guys to go back, update your roadmaps, and get them up to date so that when the, when the audits come through and they start to ask us questions, we can look at them and say, well, this is what we're, this is what we're asking for, this is what we're doing. Um, so at that bottom line there, updates are needed for the plans. Some are over three years old, and we want to make sure, there's about 20 of those, we want to make sure that we get them updated. Again, the cooperative agreements are supposed to be predicated on your, on your roadmap. If your roadmap's three years old, and you're still doing that, that's fine, but we need to show that there's progress being made. We're pushing our folks hard on the, on the and as Neil's already talked about this, on the traceability performance standards. It's their responsibility to make sure that, that we're meeting those standards. They're going to be implementing the traces, sending them to you, asking you to do them, following up to make sure they're done. In some cases, in some states, we know you don't have the personnel to do it. 
we're expecting our folks to help to get that done. Um, looking at official ID and how it's been administrated by getting back into the slaughter plants and the, and the buying stations and the markets, they should be seeing that, looking at that. I don't know how we can do compliance, which is where we're at in enforcement if our folks aren't in, in, those, in those areas. So even amongst our own people, we've, we've heard this, it's not our program. That's our own folks telling us that, and we're saying it most certainly is your program. You're in it with the states. It's a hand-in-hand -hand issue, and you better get, better get after it. And I think the message is getting out there, and they're understanding it. The outreach, the electronic records, compliance and enforcement, that's all their responsibility as well as yours. And, and there's, there has been a misunderstanding, I think, among some folks. We're going to clarify that. We're going to make sure that they understand this is not... This is not the state's issue, this is your issue, along with the states. Our top priority is to improve that baseline. It's, it's really tough for us to stand in front of the administrator and talk about an animal disease tra traceability program and Congress with the, with the figures and, and the, and the uh, averages we're reporting. So we talk about a state-federal state cooperation and success. That's the only way that's going to happen. And we've told our, our folks, and I think they understand, the message is you better get after it, and we better get it fixed. And so I'm not here to criticize it. I'm just saying we got to do a better job and um, make sure that, and there's been a lot of work done, a lot of progress, but we have to imp improve that baseline. So that's really all I had to say. Um, I'd be glad to, and Neil, to take any questions. Neil would also. Dick, right, go ahead. Yeah.